Hello everybody, it's me, Nez. All right, I'm back with you guys with another teaching, but this is, I think this will be very interesting because um, God just brought me back to the book of beginnings, you know. Well, first things first was he was like, what came to mind was surgery. And I'm like, hmm, when was the first surgery done? Well, it was performed by God himself. <laughs> he was the first surgeon, you know, he put um, Adam under general anesthesia, you know, so that he could create Eve. So we're going to visit that uh, account in Genesis chapter two. And then I want to also show you guys the parallels between the Adam and then the last Adam, who is Jesus. And you find that it's really cool. It's really cool. Okay, let's begin. So Genesis, Genesis chapter two, verse 18. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I still got that cough. Uh, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. So he's going to make um, Adam a help meet. Okay. Or a helper. Um, I would go down and you'll see that Adam did not find, um, it says Adam, like he looked among the cattle, looked among, you know, all the cre living creatures that God had created, and he didn't find um, a help meet for him or one that is um, comparable to him. Let me see what it says down here. But pretty much, I think there's, I don't know where it says someone, he didn't find anyone that was comparable to him. Trying to see where it says that. I think that's in another translation. Anyways, yeah, so none of the other animals were comparable to Adam. You know, they had their own mates, their own female male of their species, but then Adam was the only one of his species, of his kind, you know, being a human being. And the Lord said that it's not good for man to be alone in verse 18. Now, let me ask this. If Adam, the first Adam, it wasn't the Lord said it's not good for him to be alone. How about the last Adam? Is it good for him to be alone too? And I would say that was why the church was created, was birthed, okay? The woman was created from Adam, you know, to be a helpmate for Adam, right? Um, one comparable to him. And also, the, likewise, the church was created to be a help me for Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to Genesis chapter two, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Okay. Pretty much closed up, you know, the, you know, because he's performing surgery. So he opened up and, you know, made a clean incision, opened it up, you know, took out the rib and then closed back the skin, you know, the opposed the muscles, everything and skin together, the fascia and then the skin. And then, you know, as good as new, as if no surgery was performed. Right. And usually, you know, surgeons of today, they usually live at least minimal scarring. God, God, the, God Almighty did not leave us. A scar at all okay he's a master surgeon so okay so he closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the which the lord god had taken from man made he a woman and brought her her onto the man okay and adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man Okay, that's the meaning of woman, taken out of man, woman. So, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh, okay? And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, let's, let's backtrack. So, Adam beheld Eve in, you know, her beauty and just, it was just, Wow, you know, he was just like, wow. And the first thing that came out with this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This, she is from me. She was taken out of me. 
She is the same substance as me. We are one. We are the same bones, the same flesh. You know, we are one, right? You know, like there's no difference between she and him. In essence, they are the same. She is comparable to him. She is fit for him, you know. And God, remember God saw and said, it's not good for man to be alone. And, you know, and he, what does it say? In verse 18, it says, I, and God, de- the Lord God determined that I will make him, Adam, a helper fit for him. Okay. So God had that in mind. It was like, that was in his heart. You know, he, he wants to make someone fit for Adam. So in like manner, Christ, okay. Remember he says, he, he, the man shall leave his father and his mother, right? Christ, um, the word became flesh. The word, the word left his abode, left his father, you know, physically speaking, not spiritually. He's always connected with the father and the spirit. They are one, but left the heavenly, his heavenly abode to come to earth, to be wrapped in flesh, to be born of a virgin, right? He left his father and, and, you know, so that he may be put to sleep, you know, Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and sleep, you know, is associated in the word is, is associated sometimes with death. You know, you see that analogy right there, you know, for instance, in, um, first Corinthians 15 verse 51, it says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a twinkling of an, of an eye, you know, at the last trump, you know, yada, yada, yada. So the sleep there that Paul is referring to is like, we shall not all sleep, we shall not all die. But he that, you know, those who are alive and remain shall be caught up. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up. So we shall not all sleep means we shall not all die, you know, physically. So Adam, so we can say that the Lord God, he went, was left heaven, came to die for the sins of humanity. He came to be put to sleep in a deep sleep so that God, you know, the triune God will create the church from Christ because Christ will resurrect, you know, but that, that, um, what he went through, the mission that he accomplished on the cross, right? The death, the burial, and then the resurrection was to bring about many sons of God, to bring about the church, the ecclesia, the bride of Christ, okay, the woman of God, you know, in in essence. So, so the deep sleep, think of you think of death, okay. So now he when he, he was closed up, he took a rib, right, from Adam. Likewise, the rib, the side, okay, let me tell you, um, let's go to, um, but first, you know, see verse 25, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I'm going to go um, back to that passage, okay, we're going to revisit that, but let's go to um, John, um, Let's go to John chapter 19, verse 34. Okay. Um, Well, let me say that if the rib in Hebrew is uh, T-S-E-L-A or T-S-A-L-A-H, I don't know how to, you know, pronounce that. If it's Salah or Salah or Tisela or Tisela, I don't know. In Aramaic, it's Allah or Allah, I don't know. But it means it designates the side or the flank, okay? So now in John chapter 19, verse 34, it says, but one of the soldiers with a spear. Okay, let me, let's give and go up a little bit, right? Um, it said, oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> verse 28, uh, it says, after this, um, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, 
I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they spilled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So this is when Jesus died. Nobody killed him. He gave his life, right? He gave up the ghost, his spirit, you know, into your hands. I commit my spirit, O Lord, right? So the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was on a high day, was a, was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't want any bodies to be on the Sabbath. You know, they have to get prepared for the Sabbath. So they asked, the Jews asked Pilate for them to break the, the um, legs of those, the thieves and, you know, the criminals, including Jesus. So then they came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, you know, the, the two that were crucified beside Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he, he was dead already, remember he said he gave up the ghost, right? So he was dead already. They break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. His, you see that? His side. And remember rib means side or flank, right? So it designates the side or the flank. So the soldiers pierced his rib. A spear pierced his side or his rib. And forthwith came there out blood and water, right? Okay, so what came out was blood and water. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. So let's go to um, 1 John chapter 5. I want to make reference to this blood and water, okay? It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 and 8, This is he that came by water and blood even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And those three agree in one. Okay. So now the water, you know, I've mentioned this in the teaching before that being born of water means being born of a woman. So water refers to Jesus's um, incarnation, him coming in the flesh, you know, being born of water. So water and blood came out of his side. You know, this is symbolic, right? So um, now the um yeah, being born of water is being born of a woman. So that's the water signifies his incarnation. The blood refers to his death. You know, this is the, the blood of the new covenant. Remember when they were um, in the Last Supper, right? He passed along the wine and that represents what's symbolic of his death that he will, you know, he will will, because that, that was prior to the cross, that he will have to go through his death the 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 suffering the suffering the passion of the of the of you know the passion of the cross i think and then you know his sufferings on the way to the cross on his on his way to crucifixion and then the crucifixion itself i mean the scourging and then the nails being you know tearing through his flesh his um, wrists and his legs right so the blood represents his death you know, the blood that was spilt into the mercy seat, you know, in heaven. But even on earth, you know, his blood was spilt on that cross. So that's what the, the blood represents his death. Okay. Now, so blood and water came out of his side, you know, where the soldier pierced him with a spear. Okay, so now let's go to, let's go to Ephesians, right? Because what is this? This is all imagery. Yes, this is prophecy being fulfilled. But 
Think of the account in Genesis, how Eve was created. She was created out of the, the side of Adam. And we, the, where we, Jesus was pierced, we were, the church was created from his side. The church is comparable to Christ. The church is the body of Christ and he is the head, okay? And this is a picture of, of a union, of a marital union. Um, Jesus as the husband and the, the, the church as the bride, as the wife of Christ. Okay, so verse, Ephesians 5 verse 25, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And he did. He died for our sins. He died for the church, for those who have placed their trust and believed on Jesus Christ and his redempt, complete redemptive work, finished work on the cross, he died for us. He died for all of humanity. But those who are called the church are those who have believed. And he gave Christ, and the testimony is that Christ died for them, right? And so that's the word of their testimony. This is what Christ did for me. This is what Christ did for me. <laughs> so, he gave himself for, he died for us, for the church. 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And how is that done? Because we dawn on we wear on, we you know, we put on the righteousness of God when we believe. He gives us his righteousness. He takes away our filth, our sin. He removes it, cleanses us white as snow, okay? And makes us holy without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, you know, without any, defi any defilement, no stain. We are glorious because we are made righteous by God. We, were, we are justified by God, for, by Jesus, and by his blood, you know, by his, the washing of the water, by the word. He cleanses us. He sanctifies us. He purges our minds, purges us mind, spirit, soul, body, everything, okay, so that we can be presented to him as a glorious church, not by our doing, but by his, by everything he has done. Okay. So verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, you know, because what, it, why? Because husbands and wife, they're one flesh. They're, she is the bone of his bone, the flesh of his flesh. They are one spiritually and of every sense and in every sense of it. So if he, if a, a man, an individual doesn't hate themselves, of course, if the husband doesn't hate himself or his body and he, you know, he shouldn't hate his wife and he will care for her and love her as Christ loved his church, you know, even sacrificially because Christ gave up his life, right? So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, right? For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church, the Lord, you know, doesn't hate the church. He nourishes and cherishes us believers, the children of God, the sons of God. Okay. The bride of Christ, the church. So the Lord nourishes and cherishes us. Why? For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. He, Christ doesn't hate himself. God, God, so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son whom he loves. This is my beloved son, my beloved son in whom I'm, in whom I'm well pleased. You mean to tell me he hates his son? No, 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 no. He didn't hate his son. So he sent him to the cross. He loves his son and sacrificed his son. And Jesus sacrificed himself because of what? Because of the joy that was set before him. Because of the joy that was set before him. The church, the church, that glorious church that would be created in Christ was what he saw. That was the prize that he saw. And he said, I'm going to die 
I'm going to give my life for her. You know, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to enter a deep sleep, go under the knife of God, take that wrath of God so that that, so my beautiful bride, the church will be created, will be born, will be resurrected. Hallelujah. So, so for we are members of his blood, of his flesh and of his bones for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too, too shall be one flesh. This is a great, this remember this was spoken of in Genesis, the same, the same passage, the same wording, this whole leaving his father, mother, you know? So this is a great mystery. Why? And he reveals what the mystery is. But I speak concerning Christ and the church, the whole, you know, the whole imagery of the husband and wife, this whole um, structure is really about Christ and the church, husband and wife. This um, institution was created because of the last Adam, whom the, whom his Eve, his Eve will be, will be created from him, from his side, you know, from his death, burial and resurrection, her Eve or the church will be created and they will be one flesh. They are one flesh cleaved to one of them. Christ cleaves to us. He cleaves to us. He, there's this intimacy between us and Jesus and Jesus Christ. Okay. So this is a great mystery. And I speak concerning Christ and the church. Amen. Okay. And then now let's go to, um, remember about the, um, that chap, that verse in Genesis, remember Genesis chapter two, verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let's think about this. They were naked and then you net oh, and we're not ashamed? How can that be? You know, if we are naked now, isn't there like a, a sense of shame with it? Yes. And this was not then. But why was it not like that when Adam and Eve were, you know, created and, you know, together in the Garden of Eden? This is before the fall. Well, because this nakedness, their physical nakedness, wasn't an issue because they were spiritually clothed with God's righteousness. Okay. And they were pure in mind, pure in mind, body, soul, heart, you know, everything. They were pure, created, you know, he created them and, and God said it was good, right? No, there was no defect. No, no, sin wasn't in them, right? They had not sinned. Um, so, being naked was not an issue. <laughs> there was no shame attached to that physical nakedness. Okay. They were, they were actually clothed with God's glory, his presence. Okay. Okay. So let me show, um, also equate it to us that are clothed with the righteousness of God, um, that, now, you know, because this is, we are after the fall, right? <laughs> We're post the fall of Adam. So um, for them, it was just a physical nakedness, right? It was, you know, it wasn't a spiritual nakedness as at that time. But, um, okay, let me go to Romans chapter 10. Oops, sorry, guys. Let me put this on ESV. Okay, good. So Romans chapter 10, verse 12, no, verse 11. Okay. So it says, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Believe it on Christ, right? On Jesus. I mean, Romans chapter nine, I mean, chapter 10, verse nine, it says that if thou shalt confess, excuse me, if thou if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you believe in your heart, you know, that God 
um, you just believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and believe that in your heart, you are saved. For with heart, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So there's no, be, believing takes away every shame. You shall not be ashamed. You shall not be ashamed of the coming of the Lord, you know, um, you know, because when he comes, will you be found wanting? Will you be found wearing the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, wearing his righteousness, or are you going to be naked before God at his appearing? Um, and even those who are believers, are you going to be ashamed because you are being sin conscious, conscience, conscious? <laughs> sorry or you're going to be sun conscious like you know your identity you know that you are clothed in the righteousness of god that that is what the father sees jesus in you his righteousness upon you right so that's you should you should not be ashamed and you shall not be ashamed all right there's no sh shame attached to when you believe there's no shame so this is after the fall okay but after but so when um, Adam and Eve fell, they lost that, they became spiritually naked, right? The righteousness of God left them, the glory left them. And, you know, it says that they opened up, their eyes were opened. Let's still look at these images of, uh, images of being clothed um, as opposed to naked. So in Revelation, th Revelation chapter 3, verse 16 or 17, because this is talking about um, one of the churches, I think the lukewarm church, Laodicea, right? Laodicea. So verse 17, because thou sayest, sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and, and white raiment, raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Okay. Be zealous therefore and repent. So it's talking about this church that they are naked. And there's that there's a shame attached to this nakedness. But this nakedness, of course, they have clothes. Of course, they're not running around physically naked. This is a spiritual nakedness that the Church of Laodicea do not realize. Their eyes are not open to see their nakedness, and so they they are not saved. They're unbelievers. So they think they they are pr pretending to be a Christian and going through the motions and all of that but they have not even placed their trust and their faith in the finished work of Christ. They have not truly believed. They're just going through religious motions, religious acts, rituals, and all of that. And they're naked. And the Lord sees, sees it. They're poor, they're blind, and naked. They're miserable and wretched. But they think otherwise of them. They think highly of themselves. Okay, in verse chapter two, um, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, this is another um, imagery of spiritual, um, like clothing, like wearing, um, like being naked and then being clothed. So Second Corinthians 5, verse 1 to 5, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So you see, to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for what we would not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. You know, it, it's, it says, um, like, clothed further. It says, you know, but that we would be further clothed um, with, um, but, but clothed upon, or further clothed, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Okay, let me read it here so that we can understand better. Okay, okay, let's see. Verse 5, it says, 
um, for while we are still in this tent, we grow and being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that that what is so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. You know, this is the mortality, our mortality being swallowed up with immortality, okay? Now he that had wrought us for the selfsame thing is God. You know, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given unto us the earnest of the spirit. You know, he has given us the spirit as a guarantee that this will happen. You know, the spirit is given to us, to us uh, as believers as a guarantee, um, as a surety, um, to that of that day of redemption that God will redeem the purchase his purchase possession and 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 will be glorified so um he has sealed us with his spirit until the day of redemption and that's you know this is our guarantee um having the spirit of God dwelling in us you know while we're here on earth so now Okay, so you can see this imagery of being naked, but you know these are this is this is a promise to believers. This is what we await. This is what we groan earnestly for, to be glorified that our for our, the glorification of our bodies and our new bodies, our heavenly bodies is going to be our new, um, our clothing, our raiment. Um, this is going to be the manifestation of of the of the sons of God and in in that glory. This this is like a restoration, but I think is even a step higher from them what Adam and Eve were clothed with. Um um if not the same. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there, but I, I believe this is being the last Adam and this is you know, we are his Eve. This and he is Jesus being glorified. This is a whole new level than what Adam Adam and Eve ever experienced in the Garden of Eden before the fall. This is this is crazy amazing. So, um, so yeah, that's that. And then so let's go to um, Genesis chapter three. Okay, let's go back there, verse seven. And the eyes of them, who's them, Eve, um, Adam and Eve. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So the physical, they were alerted to their physical nakedness. Okay, they ate of the knowledge, the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, if they ate of the tree of life, you know, it's it's that's <laughs> that that's a different story. They're, they're not going to be aware of evil, you know. But now they ate of that tree. Now, what shouldn't have been a problem now? became distorted the image their their vision their image um became distorted right they they saw the wrong in things that god created to be good and you know um their sight their eyesight their sight it, it became different it changed right so eyes were opened because of what the fruit that they ate from the the knowledge the eyes of the understanding was open to evil, the knowledge of good and evil. And this is a whole different aspect. This is, this is, um, it's, 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 is the root of, is of sin really, is the root of sin. Um, you know, it's, it's sin, it's sin because they chose that, you know, it's, it's not is really is the good that you that springs up from that tree isn't really a pure and undefiled good it's always associated with evil right it's associated with evil it's not it's not really good okay um you know in, in terms of the standard of god and his righteousness his holiness his glory it's it's always this down you know, it's like of the dust, of the ground, it's of the flesh. Okay, so they were op they were now open to see that they were naked. They were now awakened to their flesh. You know, and then they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You know, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. You know, before they were, they were always in the presence of God. But that was stripped away. 
They were separated spiritually and they felt it. They were now awakened to the flesh. They were no longer in the spirit or connected to the spirit. The spirits died. At that moment, they ate of the fruit. And they, so, and Adam, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It was a normal thing the Lord God did. He visited them. He walked with them. He spent time with them. But today, it was different. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and, he, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. This is Adam speaking. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. This is a spiritual. He was spiritually naked. And he was now made aware of his physical nakedness, which shouldn't have been a problem. Right? I'm going to tell you why. And I hid myself. So he hid himself. And the Lord said, and he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Like, wh who said that was a problem? Who told you that you were naked? You're not supposed to know that. <laughs> because you weren't naked. I clothed you. But, hmm, something changed, right? Who told thee that thou was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Which tree was that? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course it goes on, Adam blames his wife and blah, blah, blah. So let me go to, um, to explain why the nakedness shouldn't have been a problem. But when you're spiritually naked, physical nakedness is an issue. Okay. When sin um, taints your mind and defiles you, which it does, things that shouldn't be a problem become a problem. Things that should be innocent become, you know, um, a source of... Uh, it's just you you just have this twisted you just twist everything and it's just corrupt you have this corrupt mind and you view things in a twisted and contorted fashion you know innocent things now become something else right so if uh, in um Titus chapter 1 verse 15 and 16 it says unto the pure all things are pure but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, defiled and unbelieving, defiled because of sin, unbelieving because they haven't believed in the one whom, whom sa in the one who saves, who is Jesus Christ. They haven't placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. The very mind and conscience is defiled. Even the, the whole knowledge of good and evil, even the, you know, what should be good or what is evil and that distinct to distinguish, it, that's even corrupted, is defiled. You're not supposed to eat of that tree in the first place. Right? You need to eat of the tree of life where all things are pure. All things um, are alive, made alive. Have, you know, have the life of God, is, is carrying the life of God, right? So they ate of the wrong tree and that corrupted them, corrupted their minds, their conscience, defiled them. And why did they choose that? They were unbelieving. They, they sinned because they didn't believe the word of the Lord. They didn't believe God. They believed a lie, the lie of Satan, instead of the word of God. And they ate of the tree, right? And then they lost, they lost, you know, the covering of God. You know, the, their spirits were dead. Their, their spirits died. They, you know, you shall surely die. I, he, God, the covering, his righteousness was removed from them. And they were exposed, naked. 
And then we're made aware of that because they were no longer covered. The presence of God, the glory of God, and which purifies. Now that was gone. The purity was stripped away. Sin entered man and all and spread to all, you know, the descendants of Adam and Eve. Okay. Verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work or reprobate. So even those who who um display the characteristics of 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 the knowledge of good and evil, you know, they do good. You know, the professor, they know God, they profess, but their works deny him. The work of God is that you believe, but they, these people, they are unbelievers. They're defiled and unbelieving because they don't believe Jesus, the one who saves, that his blood covers them. Or is the only one that covers. They don't believe them. I'm not going to put my faith and trust in the blood. No, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to work my way to salvation, to be saved. I'm going to save myself. I'm going to work my way to heaven, right? And God just sees that as abominable and disobedient. You're not listening. You're you're not obeying the truth of the word. You're not obeying Jesus. And he said, believe me. Place your trust me that I can save you. I alone can save you. And it says, unto every good work. So their works were reprobate, rep- reprobate, reprobate. Okay. Their works denied Christ. They're not good works. They believe, that even if it's a good work, quote unquote, they're reprobate. It's wrong. It's, it's not, it doesn't compare. It's not, it's not right before God. It doesn't justify them. It's not good in the sight of God. Their good works, quote unquote, aren't good. They're reprobate because they haven't believed. Okay. And even the works that they do to try and impress God, when only Jesus is the only one that pleased God. And when we believe him, we please God. But when you, you know, deny him and deny that very thing, reject Christ, every good work you supposedly do isn't good before God. Okay. It's evil. It's evil because Christ is the tree of life. Eat of him. And all you do is produces life. Life springs forth and that life is good and only good. And every good thing comes from the father of light, from the father who is above. But if, but if you reject that, reject him, and you present the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil is still attached. Evil is still attached. Sin is still attached. Okay. It's still defiled. <laughs> and God can't accept that offering. He can only accept the, when you offer him, Jesus Christ, offer his blood. When you present the blood of Jesus Christ, that's the only thing that can save, the only thing that pleases the Father, the only thing that is a sweet aroma to him. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think I'm done with this. So I honestly, when the Lord was taking me through all this, it was such a beautiful um, symbolism or analogy. I don't know what you want to call it, but it just a beautiful picture from the book of beginnings, you know, he, he, he instituted that, um, image of Adam and Eve and, um, the structure of husband and wife, excuse me, husband and wife. And that is the same template. That was a template for what was going to happen in the future between Christ and the church. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's it. All right. I love you guys. I hope you enjoyed this and you understood um, what all that I, all that was said today. All right. Or in this message. Okay. Okay. I love you guys. Take care. Bye.